Hello and welcome to Funk Prog Sweden, the meetup where we explore functional programming and functional programming languages and functional programming thinking. And we have explored a lot of different functional programming languages, anything from Super Haskell called Agda into Elm. Of course, we'll today we will explore more functional programming languages, OCaml and Scala. Uh, as always, we would like to welcome all new viewers and of course also our recurring viewers of Punk Prog Sweden. With that, let's head over to today's agenda. First short introduction by me, Magnus, uh, and then we'll head over to programming wi with effect handlers by Suda. Uh, and then after that presentation, we'll head over to how do we optimize Scala build times by Jamie. And today we'll also explore a new thing. We'll decided to run a post show chat on FPS Discord server. So once the live stream is over, make sure to join the Discord server. And there you can ask more questions. Jamie will join the Discord server. So if you have more elaborated questions, please join and you can ask them. Or if you just want to meet other people interested in functional programming, that's your opportunity. But first, we would like to thank Adabeat, our video sponsor of this meetup. If you want to know more about Adabeat, head over to adabeat.com or check them out in social media. And then the coming schedule for the spring 12th of March, we will be at Kivra in Stockholm. This will be live streamed, but also in Kivra in Stockholm. So if you are in Stockholm, make sure to sh and you're here on the 12th of March in Stockholm, make sure to head over to come to and visit us at Kibra. Then we're back here in the studio from Stockholm, 9th of April. And then we, of course, will be back in May and June with more meetups here. If you want to support the Funk Prog Sweden, and of course you want to do that, head over to Meetup and join the Meetup group. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And last but not least, join the post show chat today on Discord server. And if you want to find the invite to the Discord, check it out on YouTube or in the meetup group. There you'll find the invite to the Discord server. If you have questions during the presentations, please ask them on the YouTube chat or on the Discord server. And we'll forward it to the presenters. With that, let's get started and head over to our first presentation by Suda. Welcome, Suda. Second time around here on Funk Prog Sweden. Uh, hello, Magnus. Hello. Nice to be here. Yeah, you're welcome. Welcome. Welcome, Suda. The stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes. Yes, I can see it now. Wonderful. All right. Uh, so thanks, Magnus, uh, for inviting me again. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, so last time around, uh, my presentation was on introduction to Camel. So this time, uh, I plan to go a bit deeper and talk about programming with effect handlers. Uh, so before uh, we go in, um, just to introduce a little bit about myself, uh, I'm Sudha, and uh, I work as a software engineer and team lead at a company called Taradis that's uh, based out of Paris, but we also have offices in the UK and uh, here in India. I'm based out of a city in India called Chennai. So at uh, Taradis, we primarily work on uh, everything OCaml, and uh, right from the compiler, the OCaml platform, concurrency libraries, uh, CI systems, then whatnot. So uh, I lead the multi-core applications team at uh, Taridis, which uses uh, effect handlers and other concurrency constructs to build the uh, fundamental libraries for writing concurrency applications in OCaml. Uh, so let's jump right in. Uh, so today, uh, I plan to talk about effect handlers, as you know. Uh, we'll look a little bit into how they came about as a programming abstraction. Uh, 
and a very brief introduction about OCaml to those who might not be familiar with it. Um, and then I'll walk you through a small example of uh, effect handlers in act action to show what uh, it is capable of. And then um, this, I believe, is the interesting part where uh, we see how the introduction of effect handlers is shaping the concurrency story of the OCaml ecosystem. Uh, we'll also have a little sneak peek into what is possibly coming in future in the OCaml land. Uh, so let's jump right in. Okay, so uh, I'm sure some of you might have this question, what, what effect handlers are. So uh, let me try to explain. So effect handlers are a mechanism for nonlinear control flow of programs. So imagine uh, it is something like uh, exception handlers, except that uh, it is capable of resuming the computation from where it was left off. Uh, so essentially a task is suspended by the computation and then the effect handler lets it uh, be resumed at a later point via what is known as a delimited continuation. Uh, if all this sounds like jargon, uh, I think it will be more clear when we look at examples. But uh, that also brings us to the question, why should we care about this? Uh, because uh, effect handlers offer us a very nice way to build uh, programming abstractions such as generators or async await or lightweight threads and core routines. So, uh, in the OCaml land, at least, these have uh, these have shown to be more user friendly and uh, more programmer friendly in the sense they are easier to debug and they're easier to trace than what their alternatives were, which uh, are monadic concurrency libraries. We'll uh, look at them a little bit too. Um, so how did they come about? So some of you might know that uh, effect handlers are quite uh, popular in the functional programming land. Uh, so OCaml was one of the first uh, mainstream languages to have effect handlers, but uh, it, it is not the first one. So this concept in itself uh, is not new. It is uh, it's closely related to the concept of uh, shift reset that has been present in the Lisp family of languages. And it's also quite close to uh, what is known as continuation passing style. Uh, so people have gone on to show that uh, one can be ported to the other. That is, uh, effect handlers can be ported to continuation passing style and vice versa. Uh, so this was, the original idea was proposed by Plotkin and uh, Mathia Pletner in 2009. And uh, ever since then, uh, effect handlers and algebraic effects, uh, the theory behind effect handlers, have been an active area of research uh, for quite a bit. And uh, if you look at uh, any major programming language conference, I'm sure uh, you'll find a lot of material related to effect handlers. So um, it's, it's quite the hot topic uh, in both academia and uh, now that it's also being implemented more and more in mainstream programming languages and uh, some languages also offer uh, effect handlers as a mechanism through libraries if it's not supported by the compiler as yet. Uh, so there are uh, quite a few languages that support effect handlers uh, in practice. So there is a bunch of research languages uh, that are primarily built as uh, means to show how effect handlers operate in practice. Uh, so they are F, FOCA, Effect, and uh, Idris. Uh, so Idris has other uses, but it also supports effect handlers. So these, <clears throat> these languages uh, in themselves are not used to build real-life applications, but 
they are a very nice way to show how effect handlers work in practice it is uh, it is also used as educational languages to help people learn how effect handlers work but that's not all uh, there are mainstream programming languages that support effect handlers so uh, ocaml in its ocaml 5.0 release uh, included support for effect handlers not only that uh, just to give a little bit of history on that ocaml 5.0 was the first uh, major release of ocaml that had native support for parallelism and concurrency so uh, data support for concurrency is achieved through effect handlers which is supported by the compiler and back then uh, ocaml was one of the first mainstream languages to introduce effect handlers <clears throat> ever since then um, other languages like haskell and uh, scala have gone on to implement support for effect handlers Not only that, uh, there are languages like C++, Python, and JavaScript that support effect handlers as libraries. Excuse me. Um, so uh, today we are going to focus on OCaml. Um, but uh, the idea itself is quite transferable to other languages that support effect handlers. So just a little bit of introduction to people who may not be familiar with OCaml. Uh, OCaml is an industrial strength uh, function programming language. It's derived from the ML family of languages, meta language family of languages. <clears throat> so as I was saying earlier, uh, multi-core support uh, for OCaml landed not too long ago. Um, it is primarily a function programming language, but it also allows uh, imperative and object-oriented programming. Uh, though I must warn that uh, object-oriented programming is not too popular amongst OCaml programmers. Right. Um, so I know people might ask uh, the question, do people actually use OCaml at all? And uh, my answer to that is yes. OCaml is uh, used in the industry and in academia. And just to give a few examples of where OCaml is used. <clears throat> so Facebook uh, has some developer tooling that's developed in OCaml. And I was talking about uh, Teradis earlier, which, which is where I work. Uh, and we work on the entire stack of OCaml. Uh, and not only that, we also develop uh, products with OCaml. Uh, Bloomberg uh, has some trading systems the, that are written in OCaml is what I hear. Uh, Docker uh, uses OCaml. And uh, if you've used Docker for desktop, you have been running OCaml code, you, though you may not know it. Uh, Ahrefs is this data company that uses OCaml quite heavily. Microsoft and Microsoft Research use OCaml in a lot of their products. Tezos is this uh, proof of stake blockchain that's entirely written in OCaml. And uh, last but not least, uh, Jane Street, uh, who probably has the largest OCaml code base and um, uh, they work on a huge chunk of OCaml ecosystem themselves. So <clears throat> it is used quite a bit in the industry. And <clears throat> there are a lot of uh, open source projects that are written on OCaml. Um, the hack is this uh, compiler uh, that's written at Facebook. And <clears throat> Mirage OS is this system of uh, unikernels that's entirely written in OCaml. But not only that, Mirage is also a collection of uh, networking libraries that's written in OCaml. Uh, Coq 
<coughs> excuse me, Cox is this theorem prover that's also written entirely in OCaml. Um, and F star, uh, I believe it's bootstrapped now, but the first version of F star was written in OCaml. So F star is, again, a verification-oriented language. CompCert is a verification framework for GCC compiler, a subset of GCC compiler. That's also written in OCaml. Uh, excuse me. Right, uh, so now that we know a little bit about OCaml, I'll walk you through an example of uh, how effect handlers work in practice. Uh, I'm going to share another bunch of slides. Uh, are the slides visible? Yes, I can see them now. Uh, all right. Uh, so this is a very simple example of <coughs> effect handler in action. So if you see, uh, yeah, so this is the example. Uh, so if you see uh, the effect declaration here, it's, <coughs> it's basically uh, the declaration of an effect um, similar to how we would uh, declare an uh, exception and uh, it is of a type string so um, a computation is where you perform an effect uh, you'll see what that means in a bit and uh, that is attached to a handler much like uh, an exception handler So uh, when you call the perform here that you see, what uh, happens is that uh, this perform suspends the current computation. That is, it stalls uh, it from being executed. And what it then does is it looks for a matching handler in the try with uh, example. And uh, as you can see, it's matched with the effect key e here. So this this highlighted portion is the handler. Uh, so observe that uh, you have an extra parameter here, which is what is the delimited continuation. So what it essentially means is uh, the delimited con continuation holds the rest of the computation in, in it. So it, it uh, encapsulates the essence of the handler and it enables you to continue the execution of this at a later point. Uh, so as you can see, this continue line is what uh, resumes the suspended continuation uh, with the delimited continuation K and it also needs an argument, uh, which in this case is a string. So <clears throat> it takes the string too. So what's essentially happening here is uh, we are trying to run this computation. Uh, it goes to this print string and it just prints the string zero. And then it goes to the next statement, which is print string. <clears throat> and uh, it tries to perform this effect E. Uh, and uh, this perform then looks for the handler. And when it finds the matching handler, it uh, goes on to assume the suspended computation with this argument. So essentially, you are, uh, uh, what we're doing is we are uh, stopping this continuation, uh, sorry, stopping this computation, and then restarting it at a later point. Uh, so now let's see uh, what happens under the hood when uh, this computation is going on. So our uh, program counter is uh, right at the beginning of 
the computation and the the sac pointer is at uh, the beginning of our main fiber so uh, fiber is the uh, abstraction that's implemented by the ocaml runtime to simulate uh, sorry to handle the stack cannot simulate uh, yeah and then it uh, goes to the computation comp Uh, so, uh, what happens now is uh, it allocates a very small piece of stack for this computation, uh, which is called as a fiber. And uh, this holds the uh, piece of stack and the effect handler. This uh, starts with uh, 32 words and it keeps growing in size dynamically. Uh, and uh, it also points to the previous fiber, which in this case is the main fiber. Uh, so now, uh, when it encounters this effect, uh, it uh, it then goes to this uh, suspended object, which is this delimited continuation. And then we look for a matching uh, fiber, for, sorry, matching handler for this in the main fiber. Uh, so, uh, and then the main fiber gets a reference to this delimited continuation K, and then it attaches itself to the delimited continuation, right? Uh, and it continues executing. And then what happens is that uh, so the reference from the delimited continuation to the fiber comp is deleted because uh, this is a one shot continuation. What uh, one a one shot continuation means is that uh, one can continue this computation just once, and uh, trying to continue it again would lead to a exception saying uh, this is a continuation that was continued already. Uh, <clears throat> this is a conscious choice made by the OCaml compiler because uh, it's really easy to implement this in a very efficient way. Uh, there is also something known as multi-shot continuation, which lets you uh, resume a continuation multiple times, but that's not natively supported by the compiler. Uh, although there are libraries that uh, implement multi shot continuations. Uh, so once that happens, uh, the con the computation returns to just after the uh, effect was performed, right? <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, if you have been observing, uh, we get the final result as expected. It just it prints zero first, and then it performs the effect E, looks for the handler, uh, and then it prints the string one, and then it uh, continues uh, the delimited continuation with the input two, which then goes on to print it with the uh, uh, sorry the uh, print the string uh, at the statement here with the input to the delimited continuation, which is two. And then it goes on to print uh, the next statement, which is three. Uh, and then uh, it uh, prints the next statement, which is four. Right, so uh, handlers can also be nested uh, for example, uh, if you see this example, we have this two fx a and b, and then uh, we perform a in the uh, function bas, and then uh, we perform sorry we look for fx b in the function bas. So that uh, takes us to a chain of effect handlers uh, with the uh, linking that uh, bas points to bar and then bar points to two as its parent.
So this uh, uh, it linearly searches through the handlers uh, from when it encounters this effect. And this chain can keep going until the main uh, fiber that uh, that is allocated by the uh, runtime startup. So this was a small example of how effect handlers act in practice. Uh, I'm going to switch back to my uh, previous slides. Uh, is it uh, visible? Yes, I can see it now. Uh, wonderful. Uh, so uh, now that we have a little bit of idea of uh, how effect handlers work, I would uh, encourage people to look at uh, FX examples in OCaml if you're curious to see much larger uh, applications written with effect handlers like uh, schedulers, um, and the backtracking examples and a lot more. Uh, but uh, I would like to talk a little bit about how effect handlers uh, and the introduction of effect handlers is shaping the OCaml ecosystem. Uh, so uh, OCaml was, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the first mainstream languages to introduce effect handlers. So, uh, so the fiber part uh, is being handled by the runtime itself and the runtime supports one shot continuation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it is possible to implement multi-shot continuations uh, that right now is being done as uh, libraries that live outside the runtime, not by the language runtime itself. Um, so the compiler itself provides an unopinionated uh, interface for the effect handler. So the compiler doesn't enforce a scheduling policy, which means uh, library authors are uh, free to write their own schedulers. So this, this gives a lot of room for uh, innovation. And at the same time, it allows for composability for libraries to work with each other. Uh, this was, uh, again, a deliberate choice made uh, for the OCaml compiler, unlike, say, the Go, Go compiler, which has the concurrency construct baked into the compiler itself, and the scheduling policy also baked into the compiler itself. Right. Uh, so before the uh, introduction of effect handlers in OCaml, what uh, what was the concurrency story? <clears throat> uh, so to talk a little bit about that, uh, OCaml predominantly uses monadic concurrency libraries for uh, simulating concurrency uh, a, up until OCaml 4, because up until OCaml 4, there was no native support for concurrency in the compiler itself. So as far as the monadic concurrencies are, uh, libraries are concerned, LWT and async are the popular choices. Uh, so LWT stands for lightweight threats, but uh, it's again a misnomer in the sense uh, LWT provides this promise mechanism. Uh, async uh, follows a slightly different uh, way of uh enforcing concurrency and uh, async is a library that's used at uh, chain street code base and friends so what uh, this led the ecosystem to is uh, we have two different disjoint set of libraries that uh, essentially cannot interact with each other at all so um, what this means in practice is you have uh, concurrency library LWT, you have another concurrency library async, and both have libraries written on top of them. And uh, all these, all this ecosystem 
just cannot interact with each other, which means uh, more work, right? Uh, as in, let's say I I have a HTTP server and I've written LWT backend, but I cannot use it from any of async or libraries that build on top of async. Uh, so in practice, that means I will also have to write another backend for my HTTP library or else uh, I lose out on using the work that went into the async ecosystem, which is a little bit uh, not ideal, right? Uh, so this can be generalized further as the function following problem. Uh, this is a very nice. There's a very nice post uh, written by Bob Nystrom, which I encourage you all to read. Uh, um, so Bob Nystrom is also the author of Crafting Interpreters. Um, so uh, essentially, what he describes in this post is that uh, when we use so, uh, so the post doesn't talk about OCaml. It talks about a hypothetical language that looks like JavaScript, but it's not JavaScript. Uh, but this certainly applies to the monadic uh, construct in OCaml, which is <clears throat> every function has a color. Uh, we can term it as, uh, for the sake of simplicity, async versus non-async function. Uh, by async, I don't mean the async library. I mean the uh, function that is capable of running a async in a concurrent manner. Uh, so uh, every function is either async or not async. And that means uh, calling a function depends on its color. Uh, that is uh, only an async function. Uh, sorry, a a an async function can be called only from another async function. And if you want to call it to save from a function that's not async, you'll have to convert it to an async function before you call it from another async function. You cannot uh, call an async function from a sync function. So there is essentially a discord, a disconnect, uh, right? But uh, effect-based libraries uh, do not have this problem. So the uh, I, introduction of effect handlers in OCaml uh, gave rise to a bunch of libraries with uh, direct style, what is termed as direct style concurrency model. We'll come to that in a little bit. Uh, this is a non-exhaustive list of libraries that are built on top of effect handlers. Uh, <clears throat> so EIO is uh, one of the first uh, conference libraries written with effect handlers. So, uh, effect is a smaller library with a smaller core that's also written on top of effect handlers so, with a scheduler. And uh, Moonpool also uses effects, uh, but uh, it serves a different purpose, so, as in it uh, aims to be a pool of uh, system threads uh, on top of a pool of uh, parallelism enabled uh, domains. Uh, so domain is the basic unit of parallelism in OCaml5. Moonpool has a pool of domains which are capable of running in parallel and also has a bunch of, uh, also has a pool of threads. So, so mu is another uh, uh, concurrency library that's written with effects with a smaller uh, core. Riot uh, is also a library that's, uh, that follows the actor model uh, in the style of Erlang. So um, one might ask, why should I use FX to write concurrency libraries? I'll try to convince you why. Um, it's uh, essentially faster because you don't need heap allocations to simulate stack and uh, the stack is managed directly by the language runtime. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, that's not the, uh, it's not the immediately visible result to someone writing code with uh, concurrency libraries. Uh, of course, you would notice that it's faster, but if 
the difference is not much. I think uh, one might not notice it immediately unless uh, you're profiling it. Um, but the immediate benefit to someone writing applications with these libraries is that uh, concurrent code can be written in the same style as non-concurrent code. So <clears throat> if you have programmed with OCaml before, uh, you might know that uh, statements are separated by a semicolon. Uh, but uh, that's not the case with uh, monadic concurrency libraries where you need uh, bind to, uh, to essentially pipe two different uh, function calls. But that's not the case in effect-based libraries where you can continue using, uh, continue writing code in direct style with their uh, statements are separated by semicolons. So this brings us to, brings us a real benefit uh, as we use the stack, we can expect the backtraces to just work, unlike uh, in the case of monadic libraries. Uh, this also means other uh, features of the language can work. But uh, there is a small catch here. Uh, and the catch being that uh, uh, the support for effect handlers in OCaml 5 comes with a wrapper around it to implement it as a function, uh, which means uh, native effect syntax is not supported uh, directly by the compiler yet, but it will be soon, hopefully. Uh, but uh, care has been taken to ensure that the uh, function syntax of effect handlers resembles the uh, effect syntax as closely as possible. So one may not uh, even notice the difference. Uh, right. Uh, so a little bit about uh, the concurrency libraries that are written with effects. So EIO is uh, one of the first concurrency libraries uh, that was written with effect handlers. The development of EIO started even before uh, the OCaml 5 compiler was released. Uh, so EIO uses FX, uh, not only that, it uh, includes the cap capability to use IO Uring uh, on Linux machines. So IO Uring uh, was introduced uh, very recently uh, in kernel terms, possibly, uh, I think a couple years ago or so. Uh, and uh, it has shown a lot of performance benefits uh in in some in some cases at least uh so it uh, includes the io uring backend for linux but not only that it has highly optimized backends for uh, unix systems it also has an optimized posix backend it uh, uses what is known as the structured concurrency model uh, but unfortunately we may not to be able to delve deep into that uh, right now, but maybe some other time. Uh, this is just a small visual representation of what it means uh, to switch to effect based concurrency library from monadic concurrency library. So <clears throat> the one on the left is the uh, EIO code, and the one on the right is the uh, code that's written with LWT and both of them do the same thing essentially. The details are the details are not important, but uh, if you just observe the way it's structured, uh, you can see that uh, the EIO code is less messy and uh, it's easier to follow. Uh, so this is, in my opinion, the tangible benefit of using effect-based libraries over uh, monadic concurrency libraries. Uh, so there are uh, uh, quite a few applications that are built with uh, EIO. Um, but uh, the, uh, the thing here is also that uh, async and LWT have existed for a long time now, for 
over 10 years or so. And uh, there's a lot of code that's written with LWP and async. So um, shifting all of those to the new concurrency construct will definitely take time. It's certainly not going to ha happen overnight, but uh, it's happening slowly. Uh, so some examples of the applications that are built with uh, EIO, uh, I've listed them here. So Ermin is this uh, key value store that's written entirely in OCaml. It's uh, also the storage backend used by uh, the Tezos blockchain. And uh, recently, uh, Ermin has an experimental port that works on EIO. What it uh, what it means for Ermin is that uh, it enables uh, parallelism in uh, Ermin, which was not possible earlier because uh, LWT, uh, the concurrency library it was based on earlier, doesn't allow parallelism uh, to exist. So this is another tangible benefit of moving to effect-based concurrency libraries where it allows one to uh, make full use of the parallelism uh, constructs that come with OCaml type. Uh, same applies for PoHDP, which is an HTTP server. And uh, <clears throat> more applications like uh, the GRPC bindings and uh, the Wayland protocol have all been uh, ported to EIO and uh, uh, have been functioning quite uh, smoothly. Uh, right. Uh, uh, as I mentioned uh, in passing earlier, there are more uh, effect-based concurrency libraries. So <clears throat> one might ask, uh, why uh, do we have more concurrency libraries if we have one that uh, that works? So the answer to that is, uh, like I said, uh, the compiler itself does not enforce a scheduling policy. So uh, what happened is that uh, the community uh, and the programmers who want to write schedulers have different use of those schedulers. So uh, it's it's conceivable that uh, one scheduling policy chosen by say EIO may not uh, be beneficial to me if uh, what I want to do is uh, something else. So EIO uses uh, a round robin scheduling policy, but I may want to use something else. Uh, so this uh, Riot, for example, uses an actor-based concurrency model, and uh, Mu uses a simpler uh, scheduler, which is uh, just a tipo scheduler, I believe. Uh, I may be wrong here to execute uh, parallel tasks. Uh, Moonpool is another library that's implemented with FX. Uh, it has a pool of uh, what is known as system threads. So uh, OCaml has a legacy system threads, which is uh, just a wrapper around the thread that's uh, used for concurrency. Uh, that uh, is still used for concurrency, but it was meant to be used as a concurrency construct in OCaml uh, 4 and uh, earlier versions. Um, so uh, threads are capable of running concurrently, but they are not capable of running in parallel. Uh, that's the difference between a thread and a domain in OCaml 5. The so moon pool provides a way to have a pool of both uh, threads and domains. So as you can see, uh, all these libraries serve different purposes. So it's, it's entirely conceivable that uh, they all have uses of their own and uh, they tend to coexist. But uh, this uh, again has a risk of uh, what we saw earlier. So it's, it's very cool that uh, the compiler provides us the flexibility to build, uh, build stuff that works well for us. But <clears throat> there's also the risk of having a divided ecosystem. So um, again, there's the possibility of uh, having these entirely uh, incompatible set of libraries that 
continue to exist, but just cannot make use of each other. This, this again means it's uh, it's just more and more work of having to port similar uh, libraries to different backends. So we what we need here is something to unify all of these, right? Uh, so this uh, this is something we identified early on when uh, and all these libraries uh, were starting to develop. And uh, we have had quite a few proposals on how to go about uh, doing that. Uh, so the first proposal was uh, uh, quite a simple one, where uh, we have two effects, uh, suspend and resume. Uh, so suspend uh, <clears throat> stops the uh, scheduler from running and, uh, uh, sorry, a task in a scheduler from running and resume resumes that particular task. Uh, in the meanwhile, other tasks can continue running. So this uh, would enable the scheduler, whole scheduler itself to keep functioning and not being blocked. Um, this means uh, also all the concurrency libraries that want to use suspend and resume should just uh, add uh, effect handler to handle these particular effects. And uh, we, this in turn can be used to implement uh, other constructs such as mvars or uh, mutexes and channels and etc. So that uh, can be used to communicate between different schedulers. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so the other proposal was uh, domain local await, um, which does not use FX, uh, which has domain local variables to keep track of communicating between domains. Uh, and uh, so these were the first versions of the proposal. And a more refined proposal that's uh, getting close to reality is uh, this PCOS which is basically uh, interoperable effect-based uh, concurrency library. What it offers is a framework for building uh, other concurrency libraries. Uh, and since all of these libraries are built on the same building blocks, it makes them compatible with each other, right? Uh, so this is, uh, this is a very nice piece of uh, work to make sure that uh, we don't have a divided ecosystem. And uh, it is also ambitious uh, in the sense that uh, it tries to solve some of the problems we had on other conferences libraries with respect to say things like cancellation, uh, where uh, it's just hard to arrive at something which works well in each and every scenario. Uh, so the hope, uh, is, this is work in progress, and the hope is that uh, we use this as a building block to build uh, other concurrency libraries that can interoperate with each other. Uh, this is beneficial for, say, for example, so EIO is this uh, input-output library which uh, lets you do async I.O. And we have another library called uh, Domains Lib, which uh, provides uh, functionality for uh, work stealing to implement parallelism. And it's entirely possible that uh, I want to write an application that makes use of both of these. But uh, in the state it is right now, um, it's hard for uh, one to use both of them together in, in a single application because uh, they have very different notion of internal tasks. But if we were to say, port them to use uh, PCOS and build them on top of PCOS primitives, it would be very straightforward to use them together because uh, there would be a way to communicate between them and they would be built on top of the same abstractions, which is PCOS fiber, right? <clears throat> so 
um this brings us to uh, what is coming in the future for uh, ocamel and fx and uh, peepers is right now uh, being worked on and uh, once we have gotten to a point where the, the design of peepers is stable uh, we can go on to move all the libraries to be built on top of peepers and uh, that would enable the libraries to work with each other and uh, make use of the entire ecosystem rather than only a small part of the ecosystem <clears throat> but uh, there are bigger things uh, in the compiler also um so for example uh, as i was saying currently fx are provided uh, with a function syntax and uh, not uh, native support for fx syntax um eventually the idea is to support fx syntax which means one would be able to use them like how we would use exceptions directly uh, there is also uh, the idea of introducing typed effects at a later point uh, this may not be in the near future but sometime later in future where uh, we have typed effects uh, which would enable the compiler itself to check fx safety what i mean by fx safety is uh, right now the compiler cannot tell if an effect that has been performed has an handler attached to it so when it doesn't have an handler attached to it uh, the compiler throws an exception uh, we could make use of the exception and uh, and deal with it but ideally it would be nice to have the compiler itself tell us if an effect has not been handled uh, this is still an active area of research that is being worked on but uh, the hope is that at some point uh, we would have typed effects landed in ocaml and uh, that would enable uh, all the concurrency libraries that we talked about earlier to switch to typed effects so uh, this is what is coming um and uh, uh, with this uh, this uh, uh, is all the material i had uh, so i know uh, we couldn't go too deep, deep into what uh, effect handlers are ca capable of building but uh, i would encourage uh, everyone to check out uh, the different things that has been built with uh, effect based system in ocaml and, and in other languages to uh, to try to understand what uh, it is capable of and how powerful it is uh, so with that uh, that is all i had and i'm happy to take questions if there are any and uh, once again i would like to thank uh, magnus and fp sweden for the opportunity Thank you very much for your presentation, Sudo. Very, very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I will shoot straight from the... Like, you talked a bit about uh, that it might diverge into different libraries, as you mentioned. You mentioned different libraries, uh, or effect libraries. Uh, what are you currently using in your daily work or w when you work? Are you using the effect libraries or, or are you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Uh, so my team works on uh, developing the library <coughs> EIO that we talked about, and uh, we are also developing PCOS, uh in an effort to um, enable these libraries to work together. Yeah. So EIO is what we use in our <coughs> in our day to day uh, work. What's the plan for Picos? Uh, is that kind of production ready or is it? Um... Uh, it's not yet uh, production ready. Uh, it's uh, it's meant to be production ready in, in a few months. Yeah. Yeah. Um, people are saying exactly it's like in Haskell things have diverged. <laughs> there are many limits. <laughs> Uh, it's also like the innovation and freedom, you know, you give people freedom, on the one hand you get a lot of, uh, got a lot of things, but on the other hand uh, the ecosystem diverges. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, 
then I will head over to a bit. You talked a bit about what you're doing with um, Interidas. You're working with F, um, the effect library. Uh, is that only thing you're working on, or are you also working with clients and helping them building different type of applications? Uh, yeah, at Teradas, we are working on the library EIO. Yep. And uh, there are uh, projects internally at uh, Teradas that are being moved to EIO, which were once uh, <coughs> written in LWT, like all the applications were. And uh, we have already seen a lot of improvement, uh, uh, maybe not in terms of performance of the systems, but in terms of the stability and the reliability of the systems. So we have this uh, CI service that uh, used to run uh, on top of LWT and that uh, used to crash a lot. And it was also hard to debug it because LWT doesn't produce backtraces, uh, proper backtraces by design. And that's that's a well-known problem at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, ever since it was moved to EIO, it has been a lot more uh, reliable and stable. And we have observed uh, very little crashes ever since then. So that was a win. Interesting, interesting. Is there any kind of, um, do you lose any kind of, um, you talked a bit about performance or is there any performance or it's like it's the same performance but you get better stability or is it you lose performance with the EIO library? So the performance bit is subjective and uh, in general the expectation is that uh, on sequential programs, uh, you don't see greater than 10% performance degradation if you port a single core LWT application to an EIO application. Mm. But uh, it is a bit more nuanced than that because the compiler itself is quite new in it that uh, OCaml 5 was released in uh, last year, 2022, uh, yep. essentially nearly a year ago. And uh, we still have a lot of things that can be improved in the runtime and the compiler itself that needs to be identified. So we also see it as a means to identify those performance issues, which has been quite useful for the compiler. Yes, of course. Um, a completely other question. What do you, I mean, this is going, now we talked about a bit of effect libraries. Now I'm going into to the other end of the... Uh, Mm -hmm. What do you need to get started with OCaml? Is it just download? Is there like a simple package? You go to OCaml.org or something similar, and then you download the package, get the VS Code up and running, and, and off you go? Yes, yes, exactly. So OCaml, I would uh, I would encourage everyone to check out OCaml.org. Uh, I know the OCaml.org team has put in a lot of hard work to revamp it, and it's looking very, very nice recently. Uh, so what you need to get started with OCaml is just uh, download this package manager called OPAM. Mm. And uh, you can uh, also download the platform tools, the VS Code plugin, and you're good to go. It should be seamless on Unix machines. Mm. Uh, on Windows machines, if you're on a Windows machine, I would recommend uh, using the Windows system for Linux. Uh, at the moment, but uh, we are soon expecting native support for Windows with the release of uh, OPAM 2.2, which is expected in any time now. Thank you very much. So anyone out there interested, head over to OCaml.org <laughs> if you want to learn more yes, about OCaml. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we got a question from the from the chat. Uh, maybe a bit out of scope, but do you think OCaml eventually will be solving similar to how computational express expression work in F sharp? Maybe you don't. Um, maybe. Uh, I've never used F sharp, uh, so I'm not sure what uh, computational effects in F sharp do. Mm. But I'm assuming it's something similar. I'll have to check in this. Thanks. Um, with that, thank you very much, Suda. Thank you. Yes. It was a pleasure. Yes. Second time around in Frankfurt, Sweden. <laughs>